Hey, Chapel Street Church. I'm excited to talk to you about something called Rooted. Some of you already know about Rooted. It's been part of our church for a number of years now. Uh, several years ago, we were thinking and praying about, if you ask the average person who's part of Chapel Street what's next in their spiritual journey, we had a thousand different answers. And we felt like we needed one clear next step. And that's what Rooted has become. It's a 10-week journey through the gospel and scripture built around experiences. That's what makes it unique. It's not just study and filling in the blank answers. It's built around experiences through 10 weeks in community. There's a serve experience. There's a prayer experience. And these things combined in community help change people's lives. I've talked to many of you who have been deeply impacted by Rooted. Uh, some of you who are mature believers might be thinking, well, this is, I've already passed this. Not so. It's for you. If you're a brand new believer, it's for you. If you call Chapel Street your home and you're looking for the next step in your life with Christ in our community of faith, Rooted is exactly for you. We encourage you to take part in it. There's a new round of Rooted groups launching very soon. In, in fact, I've talked to so many people, one individual just recently who's been through it three times is that every time they learn something new. So I want to encourage you, if you call Chapel Street your home and you're feeling like God is moving you to take a next step in your faith in the new year, get involved in a Rooted group. Don't take my word for it. We want you to hear from those who've been part of it. This is our second time through Rooted. You probably learn more going through it with another group of people and uh, seeing new members of this new campus share their experiences, share their testimonies, growing in their faith. It's been my first Bible study, probably going to uh, change my opinion of future Bible studies just because it is so unique, so different. It's really reminded me that you know, you're loved for who you are. There's nothing you need to do in order to get that love. As I reflect back at significant moments in my Christian life, I had no idea Rooted would become so impactful. I've gained eight new deep relationships with people who were relatively strangers a few weeks before. Every week that I'm learning more and more, honestly blowing my mind as a philosophy nerd and just a science nerd, it's the coolest thing to realize that we get to have a personal relationship with the Lord of the universe. Well, again, it's so good to be with you, and uh, here at Chapel Street, part of my job is to help oversee the Rooted program, and over the last several years, we've seen so many lives change because of it. We've seen so many cool things happen, God show up in so many ways, and so today, if you're considering, you know, what is my next step in my faith? What does it look like for me to grow this year in 2022? I can't recommend Rooted highly enough. Our next session launches a week from today, and there are still spots available, so check out our website. The information is right there, and I encourage you to consider if Rooted is right for you. Again, as we uh, continue in worship today, we'll be ending today's service uh, by taking communion together. So if you're joining us online, don't forget to grab those elements at home. But if you're in person today and you didn't grab one of those as you came in, just go ahead and put your hand up, and our ushers will get that to you right now. As they do so, let's pray as we open up God's word together. Heavenly Father, we just come to you now and we're grateful uh, for the gift of worship. We're grateful that you have brought us here. Lord, that you have spoken to us, that your word is true and the promises that we sing of, that we speak of, and that we hear of are ours. Lord, right now as we open up your word, would you just speak to us? Would you just show us something new? Would you give us clarity and purpose and wisdom in this moment? We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, one of the things that has always uh, fascinated me throughout my life has been trying to understand and learn about how our brains work, how they function, often in ways that we don't even recognize in the moment. I remember learning about this in school and, and learning about this idea how our brains and our eyes are connected and how it gives meaning to the things that we see, um, even as we don't even realize that it's happening, how meaning is assigned. And the way that we learned about that was by uh, seeing a series of, of pictures of ambiguous images or optical illusions and trying to understand the meaning of what they were. And so I thought it would be fun today as we begin our time together to show you a series of those pictures, and we're going to do a little survey to see what it is that you see first. So for many of you, you'll have seen these before, but go ahead and put the first one up uh, now. Uh, so this is a picture um, that there are a couple of things that you can see. And so just by a show of hands, when you saw this picture immediately, how many of you saw a rabbit? Show of hands, a rabbit. Okay, and how many of you saw a duck? Okay, I'm mostly duck in the room tonight. Okay, um, and how many of you, now that I said the other one, now you can see both of them? 
Okay, most of us. All right, go ahead and put the second one up. Um, this one, I believe, is called the Reuben vase. So by a show of hands, when you looked at this, how many of you saw the vase in the middle? Okay, not many. And then how many of you see the two faces looking at each other? Okay, the majority of us. All right, last one. Uh, this one is called, I'm a little nervous to say this, but this one is called my wife and mother-in-law. Um, so by a show of hands, how many of you, when you saw this, the first thing you saw was the picture of the younger woman turning away? Okay, and then how many of you see the older woman, which I guess is the mother-in-law? Uh, I'm not sure about the title of that one. It's a little questionable. Okay, not many of us. Now, I have to be honest with you guys. I've been looking at this picture all week, and I do not see the mother-in-law. Like, I just, and, and so I, I shared this last night. I was preaching this last night at our Saturday night service, and, I, and someone came up to me and was, like, pointing it out. They're like, no, these are the eyes. And I was like, oh, now I see it. And that was a lie. I still don't see it. So if someone could help me out after the service, um, that would be great. It is a uniquely human thing, though, isn't it? To try to identify, to, to seek out meaning. Today, as we continue our series, this, the series that we started last week called Questioning God, this idea of identifying, seeking out, longing for meaning is going to be the focus of our time, not just with ambiguous images and wives and mother-in-laws, but with the very purpose of our lives. What is the meaning of our life? If you were with us last week, maybe you remember we started this series by talking about the, the questions that people ask of God throughout the scriptures, and especially in the book of Psalms. We talked about this, how throughout Scripture, God is consistently and patiently and lovingly accepting of our questions of Him. That there's nothing to be afraid of if you are questioning or doubting or wondering about the things of life, about the things of God. It's nothing to be afraid of, but rather it is a sign that our faith is ready to grow. It is good to question God if our hearts are ready for Him to answer for him to challenge and grow us through what he says. That's one of our goals of this series, this series questioning God as we look at the Psalms in which these big questions are asked. That brings us to today's question, the question that will be asked in Psalm 39, a question that maybe you have asked yourself. What is the meaning of my life? What is my purpose? Is it something that can be self-determined or, or self-assigned, something like one of those pictures where I can kind of make it to be whatever I want it to be? Or is it something that is given? Does my meaning come from my maker? What is the purpose of my life? It's kind of an overwhelming question, isn't it? It's, it's an existential question, something that gets to the very core of who we are and why we're here in the first place. And yet our hope for today is that as we look to the scriptures, we see guidance and clarity and wisdom. Today, if you're wondering what your purpose is, if you're wondering if you're where you should be, if you're making the most of your life, today I want to point out to you three principles that we see for a purposeful life. So let's open up uh, Psalm 39. I want to read for you the first uh, five verses of this psalm. Psalm 39, starting with verse 1. This is a psalm of David. He says this, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail and my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me as I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Oh, Lord, make me know my end, and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. It shows us the first of the three principles that we see for a purposeful life, what I'm calling the time principle. The time principle. Uh, the, the time principle simply being that your time has value and how you spend it reveals what you treasure. How you spend your time reveals what you treasure. Now, you know this. You've, you've experienced this in some way, haven't you? You know this if you've maybe been to an amusement park and you want to go on a certain ride and there's a million people in line. 
And the, the sign says that it's a two-hour wait, and you have to decide, is this worth my time? You know this, if maybe you're like Judy and me, where earlier this week we wanted to order out for dinner, and so we were looking at different places, and we went on one of those food ordering apps, and our $30 meal was somehow $60 with all the fees and everything. And even though it was only 10 minutes away, it was going to take an hour to get to us. And we had to decide, is it worth our time to not have to go out in the five-degree weather? The answer was yes, it was worth our time. You know this, maybe for you, you've even experienced it when you're coming to church and you want to stop at your favorite coffee shop to get your coffee and the drive through line is wrapped around and all the way out into the street. And you know if you stop for coffee, you're not going to make it on time. But it's coffee. It's worth it, right? Is it worth your time? We make these decisions all the time based on this principle, that our time has value. And how we spend it reveals what is most important to us. This is what David is getting at in this psalm. He's writing this, we believe, towards the end of his life, and we don't know exactly what's going on, but clearly he's going through a difficult season. He's struggling to make sense of it all. He's struggling to find meaning and purpose in his life because of what's going on. The image that we're given here is not the David that we often think about. Not as this heroic warrior or a conquering king or not as a creative poet that's faithfully praising God. Simply as a man wrestling through the questions of life. Dealing with his own brokenness. This is so important that we understand and believe this. That God's, or that, excuse me, that David's questioning and wrestling with God did not disqualify him and did not define him and did not separate him from the love of God. The same is true for us. We see in this psalm that finally, after he tries to to bottle this up and to kind of just get through it, that, that something just breaks within him. That whatever this problem is, whatever this difficulty is, it gets to the point where it's just too much. Maybe you know that feeling too. That feeling of trying to just get through something, trying to just keep it inside, uh, whether it's anger or hurt or pain, and you can just kind of feel burning inside of you, and finally it just spills out whatever is going on in your life. And here we are reminded that God can handle it. God can handle your anger. He can handle your hurt. He can handle your doubt. He does not shy away from it. Maybe today the next step in your faith is as simple as voicing to him what you've been keeping inside all these days. What David says here when he verbalizes this is so fascinating to me. So different than what you might expect. Not a demand for him to be healed or a display of anger or a to-do list for God to do to make him happy. Look at what he says. Look at verse 4 and 5 again together. Verse 4, O Lord, make me know my end, and what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. How strange is that? In the midst of this pain or hardship or difficulty, here is David saying, God, in order for all of this to have meaning and purpose, remind me how short this life really is. Remind me that my life is a few hand breaths. In other words, as vast as all of time in the universe is, my life is the width of four fingers. Remind me that I am but a breath, a vapor. If you have your Bible open, you might see that that word uh, selah after verse 5, which was a musical instruction to pause and to reflect on what was just said. In other words, David says that my life is just a breath. And then he says, breathe. That is your life. It goes by fast. It's a fascinating response. It shows us the time principle in action that when you recognize your life is but a breath, your time will reveal what you treasure. We see this in Psalm chapter 90, uh, verse 12. Psalm 90, verse 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. 
This is something that I think uh, those of you that are parents understand in a unique way. In fact, I remember when Judy found out that we were going to be parents, probably the thing that we heard the most from people who have gone through it before is that it goes by fast. Don't blink. You'll miss it. It's long days, but it's short years. We've heard that over and over again. Downstairs in the lobby here at this campus, uh, there's a display uh, that I stole from, so don't tell them. Uh, but, but there's a display of, of a series of jars filled with marbles. And the idea is that this jar represents the, the time at home, the childhood of our son, Luca. That each, each marble in this jar represents one week of his life until he graduates high school. One week of the roughly 950 or so weeks until he becomes a man, becomes an adult, and, and graduates and then starts paying us rent. Just kidding. Each marble, another step, another milestone, another opportunity to teach him what matters most, that God loves him, and so do we. The idea is that you take one marble out of the jar for every week, a visual for the passing days. It's an appropriate analogy, don't you think? That parenting is about losing your marbles. <laughs> it seems impossible as we think about this as, as our son turns 13 weeks old today. It seems impossible that it will go as fast as everyone says that it will. Now, I don't share this to bum anyone out or overwhelm you or, or make you feel like it's too late for God to do something in your life or your family's life because it's not. This is just a reminder of something that you already know, that your time and your family's time and their lives are precious. They have value. That each marble, each week, whether it's filled with making memories or, or just making a mess, is a gift that God has given you for a purpose. How you spend your time reveals what you treasure. Or to put it another way, I love how Reggie Joyner puts it. He says, when you count the days, you make the days count. This is the time principle. And it applies not just to, to parents, but to all of us who are followers of Jesus. It's what David is crying out to God in this psalm. He's saying, God, remind me of how short all of this is. Remind me that my life is just a breath. Remind me that this season will end. Remind me that every season of my life, no matter how good or how bad, is a gift that you have given me and you have given it to me for a purpose. Remind me what matters most. This is the prayer of his heart. And it is a prayer that brings purpose to us. I think one of the challenging things of, the, of this season is that we've been reminded of something that's always been true, no matter how much we try to fight it, that life is fragile and time is precious and not one of us can predict what tomorrow will bring. Only God knows the measure of our days. For the follower of Jesus, this does not have to be depressing news. This does not have to put you into an existential crisis. Rather, let it bring you direction and urgency and intention with the time that you have been given. To live with eternity in mind. To use the time that you have for the things that you value the most. To use however many marbles you have left to teach and remind your kids that they are loved by God and loved by you. To use the time that you have at your job or, or in your school to do what matters most, not just about getting good grades or making good money or working up the corporate ladder, but to live on mission, to love and serve people in your life for however long they're a part of it. Your life and your time is precious. It is a gift given to you from your heavenly Father for a purpose. Use it well. Don't waste it. This is the time principle. Next, we see the uh, second principle for a purposeful life, which I'm calling the wealth principle. The wealth principle. Uh, let me just read to you verse 6 of Psalm 39. It says this, Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. 
He heaps up wealth, and he does not know who will gather. Remember as a kid, a particular summer vacation where our family went to uh, the beach for a week, which doesn't that sound so nice right now? And one day at the beach, my brother and I decided that we were going to build the most impressive sandcastle that anyone has ever built. It wasn't going to be one of those ordinary sandcastles. Like, we took this seriously. We had plans. We had, you know, shovels and buckets, and, and we built the moat so the water wouldn't get in. Like, we spent a whole day working on this sandcastle. And it was awesome. It was so cool. It was like as tall as we were. And we were so proud of this thing. And I told my parents, I'm going to be an architect because imagine what I can do with real materials if this is what I can do with sand. Like, I was all in. We went back to the hotel, went back to the beach the next morning. It was gone. Everything was destroyed. I don't know if it was the tide that had come in or someone had just walked up and kicked it down. But everything was destroyed. And I was heartbroken. Because I'd spent all this time, all that effort, an entire day of vacation, and it went for nothing. This is what David's talking about here as he's working through the meaning and purpose of his life. He recognizes something that was true all the way back then and is true for us today. But there are many people that would see this time principle, this idea that time is short, and they would say, if that's true then I'm going to do whatever I can to find pleasure or fun or success or wealth, whatever this life has to offer me, because you only live once. This is going to be the purpose of my life, to pursue those things. This is the foundation for how so many people live, where the brevity of life leads to a self-centered, satisfaction-focused kind of life where meaning is self-assigned and expression is the goal, in whichever way brings me the most happiness in that particular moment. But what David says about this is so fascinating. That people who live that way turmoil for nothing, is what he says. That word turmoil literally meaning to make a bunch of noise. In other words, you're making a racket to do a bunch of things that don't ultimately last. This is his message. This is what Solomon talks about in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1. He says this in the NIV. It says, The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Kind of dark. Why do people gain, or what do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. And then verse 11, no one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Everything is meaningless. It's kind of a serious, kind of dark, kind of strange topic to start off a letter. And what Solomon isn't saying is that we should just give up and not care about anything because none of it matters. No, what he's saying is that ultimately there is nothing that you can find in this world No job, no person, no human accomplishment, no earthly cause that will stand the test of time. Everything has a season. Everything will go. Even those who change the world will one day be forgotten. This is the message that we see in James as well. In James chapter 4, he's talking about this. He says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. See, this is the truth of of life that those who try to self-assign meaning always miss that they are relying on the unreliable. They're spending their lives building a house on sand. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 7. He talks about those who follow and obey his commands, building their house on a rock, and those who don't, building their house on sand, and take it from me, even the coolest sand castle ever doesn't last. The truth is that in the kingdom of God, wealth and success And purpose is always found less in what it is that you're doing and more in who it is that you're becoming. So often we get confused about this, where we become convinced that that there's one specific thing, one path, one door that God wants me to walk through. And we use phrases like living in the center of God's will. 
God opening or closing doors. And somehow, it, or sometimes it feels like life can be sort of like a scavenger hunt where we're trying to track down God's will, trying to find that one thing that he wants us to do. It can be hard. It feels exhausting. And certainly there are times where God gives us a prompt or direction, and of course we should obey. But more often than not, our purpose is not found in what we do, but who we become. This is the message of Colossians uh, chapter 3, verses 23. This might be familiar to some. It says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. What if this is how we thought about our purpose? Wouldn't there be less pressure and more freedom? What if this is how our high school students thought about their post-graduation plans, whether going to college or, or starting a career? What if they thought about this not as a door, but as a filter to think about? What if this was their filter, that, that if I go to this school or if I do this thing, will I become more like Jesus? Will I be able to grow in my faith? Will I be able to live on mission for him? Or does everyone I know that go to that place get distracted by things of the world? What if this is how you thought about that job opportunity that you're considering? Through this filter of, is this an opportunity for me to live on mission? Will, they, will I be able to work with integrity? Will, they, will I be able to be there for my family? What kind of person will I become? Will I be able to bring glory to God? If you believe that God has given you a specific calling or direction, then go and obey. But for many of us, our purpose has less to do with what we've been created to do and more with who we've been created to be. This is the wealth principle, that in God's kingdom, wealth is measured in the eternal and not in the temporary. It's measured not in what you do or who you know or what you make, but who you are becoming. Measure your life this way. Measure your purpose this way. Build your house on the rock and not on the sand by, by defining your wealth and your love and your compassion and your generosity. Define it by bringing glory to God. This is the wealth principle. That brings us to our last principle, which I'm calling the waiting principle. Let me finish Psalm 39 for you, starting in verse 7. It says this, And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Look away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. This is where David ends this psalm. This is where he lands after his distress and his angst and his questioning of life. In the midst of what he sees as the consequences of his own sin, he asks this question that's so interesting. One of the most important questions that we can ask. Look at verse 7 again. Look at this question he asks. For what do I wait? What is it that I am waiting for, hoping for, longing for? What is it that I am looking towards to bring meaning out of this misery? God, it is only you. It's interesting. Just as we saw David wrestle and doubt and deconstruct, we also see here the process of reconstruction happening in his life. We see this reconstruction, this firm foundation, this solid ground that he lands on. That even though things don't make sense, and even though he has questions, and even though he doesn't know how everything is going to work out, his hope has not changed. His hope that God is worth waiting for. The promises that he has made are true. The life that is ahead is worth it in the end. This is so important that we understand that God is worth waiting for in your questioning. Maybe right now things don't make sense in your life. Maybe because of loss or grief or, or, or a painful experience, you have questions that you've never felt so much before. 
God is worth waiting for. Maybe right now you're living in the consequences of sin, whether it's your own or someone else's or or just the world's. God is worth waiting for. Maybe right now you look around and, and you see people who claim to follow Jesus or people who represent his church fail, disappoint you, let you down. It makes you question everything. God is worth waiting for. He is worth waiting for. This is David's solid ground, the foundation on which he can stand, that God is good and holy, and if he is holy, then he is trustworthy. And if he is trustworthy, he is worth the wait. I love how the psalm ends. I want to point you to verse 12 again, this idea that I want to end with. He says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears. And then look at what he says. For I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. This is so good. That if you've put your faith in Christ, that you are a sojourner or traveler with him. This is your purpose. To live as a guest. To live with eternity in mind. I think of it like this. Remember when you were a kid and you would have a sleepover at one of your friend's houses and everything was just a little bit different. They didn't make the food the same way. It didn't smell like your house. Uh, The routines were a little bit off. Everything was just a little bit different than what you were used to. This is life for the follower of Jesus. Feeling like we don't quite belong because this isn't our home. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is the meaning and purpose of your life. To be light, even in the midst of darkness to live in a way that brings glory to God today and every single day that we're here. As we were talking about this message this week, Pastor Brian uh, shared a story with me that that, uh, earlier this week, the oldest living uh, U.S. veteran of World War II passed away. His name was Lawrence Brooks. He passed away at the age of 112 years old. Can you imagine that? 112 years. He was born in 1909. Can you imagine all the things that he saw? People were sharing tributes about him and and the life that he lived, and it was revealed that whenever someone would ask him about the secret or the key to to his uh, longevity or the key to his successful life, he would always answer the same way. He would insist that it would come down to two things. He said, serve God and be nice to people. I love that. Serve God and be nice to people. Church, if you want to live a fulfilling life, start there. Love God, love your neighbor. There's no better place to start. Whether you have 112 years or not, there's no more fulfilling thing that you could do. Live in a way that brings glory to God. This is the true meaning of your life. Today, as we Uh, come to the Lord's table, it's good for us as we talk about meaning and purpose to take a moment to reflect on the meaning and purpose of communion. You can go ahead and grab those elements if you have them with you as we think about what this represents. That this is not just a, a ritual that we do, not just an empty tradition, but something that matters as we reflect on who Jesus was and the purpose for which he came. You can take that out and go ahead and take off the top layer. And and as always here at Chapel Street, we believe this is God's table and not ours. You don't have to be a member to participate in this, but simply to be a follower of Jesus. You can go ahead and take that top layer off as we think about what this represents and what this means. We think about the day that Jesus was with his disciples. And he took the bread and he looked at them and he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this and remember me. Let's eat together. You can go ahead and take that second layer off if you can. As we reflect back on on the purpose of the cup as well. 
On the purpose of what this means, that, that same night that he was with his disciples, he looked at them. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. New covenant, a new promise, a new way of living. Drink this and remember me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you again grateful for the purpose for which you came to us. Lord, we're grateful for the freedom that you've given us. Lord, we're grateful for a new purpose that you have given us to glorify you, to love you, to love our neighbors every day of our lives. Father, help us now just to bring clarity and wisdom into our lives, to bring meaning into our lives, to remind us of what matters most today and every day. God, allow us to focus on you now, to hear from you, and to be reminded of just how much you love us. We pray this in your name. Amen.